All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm hoping that you will learn something from today's session. I'm also hoping that you will uh, take away an idea, a spark, something. But let's make this a quid pro quo. Teach me something. How do you say good afternoon? Dobre veg je. Dobre veg je. Is that right? Dobre veg je. There we go. I will forget that by the end of this session. So this is a controversial topic. All right? I expect you to come here with an open mind. Not everything that I say you're going to agree with, and that's good. All right? But I do want you to not go, oh, that's not going to work in our company, or we're special because of X, Y, and Z. I challenge you not to dismiss the idea, but to think as to how might you make that work? How might you take the idea, the kernel of truth that I'm going to talk about, and apply it and take it much deeper than that? Make sense? So, everybody stand up. This is the part of being a speaker I love, uh, the blatant abuse of authority. All right, if you are a project manager, stay standing. If you're not a project manager, please sit down. Whew, okay, I may not survive the next 24 hours. There's a lot of project managers in the room. Okay, so speaking to you who are standing, all right, what I'm not about to say is that you don't have a job. I'm not about to say that you're all about to be fired. What I am saying is that the role of the project manager is going to evolve over the next five years. Right? And you need to understand that organizations, agile organizations, are going to need people with your skill sets but not necessarily with the project part of it. So we're going to have a very different conversation. Thank you. Everyone else who was sitting, right, I'm giving you ideas. I'm giving you a spark. I'm giving you something that will hopefully trigger a conversation at work, a conversation with your managers, and a conversation with your colleagues as to what is important in an organization. There is a question I am going to ask at the end of the session, but I'm going to ask it for you now. And it is the most important question you need to be able to answer. All right? Project managers, have you ever been asked this question, how much will it cost? Yep. Everyone's been asked that question? Good. That's the wrong question. <laughs> what is the right question? <laughs> Are you sure? What will I get? What will I get is still, it's still a factor of cost. All right? Go deeper. Is it valuable? Yes. We phrase that generally as not how much does it cost, but what is it worth? All right? A manager asks a subordinate, how much will this cost? A subordinate asks a manager, what is it worth to you? And that is the fundamental premise behind a lot of what we're going to talk about here. So, but half of you are project managers, so I'll go quickly through this section, but for the rest of you, let's just make sure we all agree on where we're starting. The project. This is a definition of a project, a temporary endeavor, okay, to deliver products, services, and results. Okay, it develops a change in an organization. Does anyone disagree with this definition? The last time I gave this presentation, someone put up their hand, and it was very embarrassing, so <laughs> you all agree? Good. So this is what I take umbrage with. I fundamentally disagree that this can answer the question, what is it worth? This is about outputs. It is about creating a, 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 a widget. The widget is in itself of no value. Only how it is applied and how our customers and our users use it gives it value. So to deliver a product or service does not actually talk about the value of what we're trying to do. So, what's the problem with projects? So, okay, maybe we can sort of still use a project. Maybe we can uh, just add the value definition in. Because project management covers a lot of domains, okay? Cost, time, scope, risk. Let's add value into that. Let's make value management the role of a project. All right? But I'm going to argue that there's actually a fundamental flaw in the way that projects run. All right? There are costs, overheads, overruns and opportunity costs which apply when you run a project. An overhead okay, is half of you in this audience.
project managers, I'm sorry to say, you are in overhead cost. Right? And I know from personal experience, having been a project manager for way more years than I would like to remember, that I have run projects where my salary was more than 20 or 30% the cost of the project. All right? Where this or organizations who, they don't have a lot of money and they run small projects, a couple of hundred thousand dollars here, 200,000, 300,000 dollars there, and if it's a three month project with two developers and a project manager, the project manager is a significant portion and the overhead becomes untenable, right? Now, overruns and opportunity costs are less of an issue in an agile setting. In an agile project, okay, we still have a variable scope, or at least we should have a variable scope. So we're able to deliver quicker, okay? we're able to, so that reduces our opportunity costs, but we're also able to ad inspect and adapt and learn, so that does affect our overruns. But they still occur because of the fundamental nature of a project. A project is a temporary endeavor. At the start of a project, I don't care about the value, I care about the widget. What is, I, what is it that we're going to build, not what is it worth to the company? So, the other problem is that projects fail. Now, I have a lot of data about this. I'm writing a book on no projects, and as part of writing a book, you have to do research. So I have got study after study after study, which I can share with you if you want. It's all in the notes behind these slides of failure rates of projects, including agile projects. Now, of course, the definition of failure does vary, but if we take the traditional project management model of time, cost, scope, okay? Hands up, project managers. Have you ever, in your entire life, run a project that was on time, on budget, and on scope? One, two, three of you, four of you, five, yeah, so what's that as a percentage of this audience? Maybe single digits, okay? So if 90% of you have never had a project that by the definition of what is widely considered as the project management gold standard, that iron triangle, if 90% of our projects are failures, maybe the answer isn't try to do better projects. We've tried to do better projects for 50 years and we're still failing. Maybe the answer is not to do the project at all. So, actually I'll talk about that a bit later. There are also another couple of issues in terms of how projects are operating, projects end. All those key skills, all those, that team dynamics, okay? And Andre's talk in the morning was very good when he was talking about keep the team together, all right? That's really important. And projects, by the nature of them, when they are done, because they have an end, when they are done, the teams scatter, the teams disperse, and all the skill is lost. Now, DevOps is actually, I think, one of the greatest things to emerge in and around Agile in the last couple of years. Because DevOps is actually changing the dynamic and the relationship between the project and BAU. All right, so I'm really glad to see um, uh, uh, more and more organizations adopting DevOps models, but it's still only the beginning. Now, this is a bit blurry, you can't see very well, but this is a history of the projects. All right. We have been using pretty much unchanged since 1970 the current project management model. The Gantt chart, which I know we're an agile project, so we're not really using Gantt charts. There's Henry Gantt, 1870. His Gantt chart, 1907, 1900s anyway. All right. All right. So these um, PERT, critical chain, uh, sorry, cri cri critical path, these are project management models which have been around for like old, longer than most of us have been alive, okay? Who here was born in the 50s? Okay, older than all of us have been alive, all right? And yet we're still trying to use this management model which is archaic, all right, to build things which didn't, weren't even conceived of 50 years ago. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is continuous, continuous change. And this is actually very, very important because everything that we do in this day and age is continuous. And I'll get to that. So let's give you a definition. What is no projects? And I'm, the cardinal sin of speakers is to read off the slide. I'm going to read off the slide. The alignment of activities, work, to outcomes, okay? What the business results that we're trying to achieve, 
measured by value, constrained by principles, you can't do anything that you want, and supported by continuous delivery technologies. Now, that last one's optional, okay? You don't have to have continuous delivery in place to do no projects. It does kind of help because of this, the continuous culture. Think about it, think about your organization. Is your organization currently doing something along the lines of continuous, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, or are you working towards it? Hands up. That's <laughs> this side, but not this side. <laughs> I don't know what it is about this side. Yes, all right? So I would say more than half, 60, 70% of this audience, your organization is currently working towards continuous, okay? You have this culture that is developing. It's not quite here yet. Some organizations have it, but most organizations it's still developing, of continuous. Things don't stop. A project does, all right? So if, you're, if you have this idea of we're going to this continuous model, why are we using a temporary endeavor? Where to begin? So this is where we're gonna get into the actual, let's give you something to take away. So remember our definition? The alignment activities to outcomes, all right? So what's the first thing we need? An outcome, all right? Now, what was the most important question I asked? What is it worth? An outcome answers that question. What is it worth? That is the fundamental intention of an outcome, all right? You might sometimes call them business results, you might call them benefits, all right? But the intention and the premise is still the same. We have something that has value, something that we plan, something that we think about. It doesn't change very often, all right? And we can actually create teams dedicated to delivering outcomes. And these outcomes are tangible to the business. So what are some examples? All right, uh, project managers. Uh, hands up again, project managers. Beautiful, okay, so you. Can you tell me what project you're working on right now? Uh, HRM, system. HRM system. I love asking that question because they always get the answer wrong. Why are you doing a HRM system? <laughs> because I was told to, okay? You don't know the business outcome you're trying to achieve. What project are you working on? Can you say? Yeah, you. No project, at the, oh, lucky you. <laughs> All right, what project, someone, give me a project you're working on. Online casino, Online casino. sounds fun, why? To earn money, thank you very much. That is an outcome, revenue. And in fact, that is probably the most fundamental outcome that most businesses have. Now, outcomes, we can be a little bit more uh, specific than that. The organizational outcome is revenue, all right? But you're gonna have teams with specific responsibilities. Operational stability, okay? Who here is doing um, infrastructure projects, replacing data centers or moving to the cloud or things like that? Okay, a couple of you, all right. The outcome that you're trying to achieve is operational stability, okay? It, it, the value of a server is actually irrelevant as long as it's up. The minute it's down, we have a problem. So your outcome is operational stability, all right? HRM, all right? Well, human resources always has specific outcomes. Maybe it's ret um, retention or attrition. Maybe it's um, uh, staff satisfaction, all right? Maybe it's reduction of costs, all right? It doesn't really matter. You need to find out what your outcome is. Now, I talk about this thing called an outcome profile. Now, this is very, very simplistic. You can go into a lot more detail than this. And there's a gentleman by the name of Tom Gilb, G-I-L-B, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting earlier this week. He's just published a book called Value Planning. All right, and for the project managers in the room, have a look at it, because he teaches you how to quantify pretty much any benefit, any value. All right, so something like staff satisfaction how do you quantify that? And often when you're talking uh, with managers and, and you're writing a business case and you're writing benefits, those benefits are the last thing you care about. They're there to get finance to sign off on it. 
All right, so what we're doing is we're putting the benefit at the start. We're saying, forget the product. I don't care what project you're running. I don't care what product you're creating. I care about getting more subscribers. I care about improving staff retention. I care about, doesn't matter, all right? But I don't care about the work. I care about the value to the business, and that's the outcome. So that's where you have to start. You start from an outcome. The second thing you need are principles. All right? These are constraints at an organizational level. A principle, all right, is, sorry, without principles, without constraints, all right, an outcome-based team could do anything that they want as long as it achieved that result, including destroying another team. All right? So there's a quote by Deming. Um, if you don't know who Deming is, uh, Google him. Okay? Absolute amazing person, okay? wrote a lot of great stuff about what we would now consider to be agile in the 70s. Right? And he said, and I paraphrase, if you give a manager a target, he will destroy the company to meet it. Does that sound familiar? Yeah? All right, so an outcome is a target. We're looking for more subscribers, staff retention. All right? If you give me that, without context, I can deliberately or not deliberately destroy the company trying to achieve that, especially revenue targets. All right? People, especially salespeople with revenue targets, they have, can cause so much damage to organizations right, without context because they just have this KPI that they're trying to reach. So we give you principles, constraints. Now, that could be of all types. I tend to recommend that small organizations limit to uh, 10 or 20 principles because the more principles you have, or every principle adds cost, okay? Principle number one, all external facing products must comply with our brand guidelines. That makes sense, all right? Principle number two, all right? All software, pro uh, there you go, projects. All software development should have 80% code coverage of unit tests. That's a pretty good principle, all right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, these are constraints, guidelines that apply to every single team, no matter what they're doing. All right? Now, if I'm a HR team, the, the unit test one doesn't really apply to me, okay? but that's where common sense applies. The other thing I recommend is with these principles, use something like the Moscow rating. Must have, should have, could have, won't have. Now, the reason I recommend something like the Moscow rating is that every constraint adds cost. All right? So must, you cannot break this guideline. Okay? It must comply. No exceptions. Should means you can, if you have a good reason, you can get an exception for this. Could, it's at your discretion. Okay? If it doesn't add too much overhead to the work that you're doing, do it. If it does, eh, it's okay if you don't. Won't is a, it, 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 it's a negative guideline. Do not do this, okay? So these working principles give us the ability for our outcome teams to actually collaborate in a meaningful way. Um, the th let me just jump ahead, because I actually want to talk about one other thing first, and I'll go back. The third thing that you need when you're building uh, a no project space thing is the understanding of cross-functional teams. Right? And I mean true cross-functional teams. I call them value delivery teams because they are fundamentally built around the delivery of value, specifically in the context of an outcome. All right? I'm not talking matrix organizations where the project is a horizontal stripe of skills coming out of functional silos. All right? I'm talking about people who are dedicated, their line manager, and that team is accountable for that outcome. So this is a cross-functional team on steroids. Right? And this is quite critical because if you do not have the skills to achieve an outcome, right, then we have a problem, okay? Because you are accountable for that outcome, and that's the scary word. Right? If the organization says your team is accountable for revenue or staff satisfaction, the great thing about being product focused is you can be successful and the business can fail at the same time. All right? Your project, install a HRM system. 
Okay. Well, let's say the outcome is to reduce um, staff attrition. If it doesn't reduce staff attrition, you were successful, but the organization was not. Okay? Building a casino. The intention is to make money. Okay? But okay, if you can build the most amazing piece of software in the world, but if you don't actually make revenue, you were successful, but no value was achieved, and the company probably goes under. All right, so we can also turn it around. Let's look at traditional projects, the channel tunnel. Anyone here gone through the channel tunnel? Yeah, a couple of you? OK. Channel tunnel was 80% over budget. All right? um, and many years late. I don't remember exactly how many. Tell me, was that a failed project? Let's say the traditional def definition, time, cost, scope. By traditional definition, it's a, fa it's a failure. Okay? Now, Channel Tunnel made its money back faster than anticipated. Okay? Now is it a failure? All right? This is why the value definition, the how much is it worth, is the most important question. So let me just go back, because I need you to understand about va value. And there's four things you need to understand about value. All right, first of all, everything that we do is intended to add value to an outcome whether you know it or not, even right now. But value, the work that you do, the value of that will degrade, okay? And it's very simple. Uh, you've all seen a project kicks off. It's great, it does something, it's successful, and then the team disbands, right? But the value of what that project created slowly degrades over time. And, though, and then in another three months or three years, you need to do a version two or an upgrade project to rekindle that value. The other thing to understand about value, and you should all probably know this, is that you don't always work in highest value order first. Sometimes there's foundational work that needs to be done, okay, that is of low value, okay, it does not have a material impact to the outcome that we're trying to achieve, okay, but we've got to get it done first because it's, it has a due date, it's legislative, regulatory, there's all sorts of reasons why we've got to do it. All right. There's also a concept of local maxima. All right. Your product, all right, the outcome that you're trying to achieve, can no matter how much more work you do, you're unable to. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You're unable to have a, a change to the outcome. Okay. You're unable to get more subscribers, no matter how many more features you add. All right. You've reached a peak value. Okay. But sometimes that is misleading. All right, sometimes you need to actually drop down in value in order to take a different direction to go higher again. All right? And you can see that in the products that we use today. Microsoft Word okay, ripped out hundreds of features when they went from 2003 to 2000, uh, sorry, from 2000, yeah, to 3 to 2007, uh, and again from 7 to 13. Right? They reduced the value of their product in order to make it more valuable. All right? Make sense? The last thing I recommend is ask, so what? All right, and I actually recommend you nominate someone on your team, okay, and have it rotate, not the manager, okay, because uh, I'll explain that in a second. But their job is to play devil's advocate. Their job is to ask, so what, in a safe and non confrontational way, okay? It's not personal because it's their job. All right? And they can actually go, okay, I know we need to do X, but if we don't do it, what's the worst that can happen? All right? And ask yourself that question. All right? What's the worst that can happen? Well, more often than not, actually nothing. All right? I, kn I know from experience that um, uh, look at your organizational policies. All right? how, many, how long does it take to get approval to do something? All right, uh, like travel or go to a conference. All right, look at your annual salary. It's like, how much money did I s did the company spend arguing about whether I can or can't go? All right, I'll guarantee it's probably more than the cost of the conference. All right, so ask yourself, if I don't do this, so what? If I don't get approval, or if we don't have this approval process in the first place, what's the worst that will happen? 
okay? And the reason I say don't make it a manager is because if a manager asks that question, they have institutional authority, okay? So we don't want somebody whose word carries authority. We want someone who is challenging, but not authoritative, or, or personally authoritative, but not institutionally authoritative. Okay, so that's the macro level. We have an outcome. But hands on keyboard, we still have to deliver the widget, we still have to deliver the HRM system. Uh, I'm not saying that the work goes away. I don't have a magic wand that we can wave and go, okay, we're gonna get rid of projects and we'll get rid of all the developers as well while we're at it and all the testers and the work will still magically get done. All right, someone still has to write the code. All right, so let's talk about now the micro level. We've got the macro, we've got an outcome, we have a team. This team has principles, constraints, all right, and they are structured fundamentally around the delivering of value, all right? Now, let's be clear. I don't give a damn what that team works on, all right? I'm the CEO of the organization, all right? As long as that team is accountable for an outcome, all right? Staff satisfaction, all right? Revenue, all right? Then I don't get, care what they do, all right? How much is it worth? That team has a budget. That budget is not driven by how much does a widget cost. It's driven by how much is it worth to achieve the outcome that I have in mind. And as long as the minimum, like as long as it's not too low, like if, if the answer to what is it worth is less than we can do to achieve any change in that outcome, then we don't begin in the first place because it's not worth doing. All right? But as long as it's worth doing, then it doesn't matter what I do. And that's actually the key point. So we have this idea of activities, okay? Now, think of activity as anything that you do. It is a discrete activity that adds value. Now, each activity adds an insignificant amount of value. And I mean that in the statistical definition, statistically insignificant, right? We cannot measure the value of an activity because it's too small. We measure them in aggregate. 10, 20, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks of activities should have a material impact on the outcome. But an individual activity, whilst it is valuable, is not measurable. Okay, so, so do be clear about that. So I use this thing called an activity canvas. Now, you can use any sort of model that you want. This is something that I find very effective and that the companies that I've been working with to do this kind of approach have been using to great effect. Uh, it's a very, very simple canvas, and you probably have seen something similar before. Value, effort. All right? This is the order we want to work in. Highest value, lowest effort, to lowest value, highest effort. All right? Now, this is a management tool, not a planning tool. We don't put things up on the board and then leave the room and ignore it. This is something that we use day in, day out. Now, technically, this is also a Kanban. Uh, this is technically a Kanban, right? though not the one that you'd be more familiar with from David J. Anderson's book. So you put all your activities on there, you plot it. Now, here's a question. If each activity, the value is statistically insignificant, how do we plot the value? Have a guess. I shall point at people. Who's looking like they're falling asleep? <laughs> you weren't even paying attention to the question, were you? <laughs> oh, you're drawing it up. So the question is, all right, if value is statistically insignificant all right, for an activity, how do we plot the value on the axis? Well, everything has value, all right? And, and I'm not... I'm not if it, if it doesn't have value, we shouldn't be doing it, okay? So I'm talking about the magnitude of the value, all right? Anyone have a guess? Sorry, who said relative? Perfect, that is the exact answer, okay? It's not like relative estimation like story points, it is purely relative, all right? Which of these two things are more valuable than the other? It's a bubble sort, we all know what bubble sorts are, all right? And so it doesn't matter the magnitude, it doesn't matter if it's three value points or 10 value points, it only matters it's more valuable than something else. Likewise with effort, okay? Like, 
this is sort of aligned to the no estimates thing. It doesn't matter what the estimate is. It just really matters, is it harder or easier than something else? All right? And that gives us the ability to plot it on this chart. All right? This is what we do first. This is what we do second, third, and fourth. All right? Make sense? So we now have a situation where we have a team structured appropriately with the right skill set, all right? All right? and all the good agile behaviors have empowered and so forth. They have accountability for that outcome. They have authority to enact and actually deliver that outcome. And they can decide what to do. Now, you can introduce design thinking. You can introduce all sorts of user um, experimentation, UX, HDD, to make sure that you're doing the right thing. All right? But it's the team's fundamental decision of this thing, this activity, is, will have the greatest impact on the outcome we are trying to achieve versus this other thing. And so that's what we're going to work on first. And we will work on it, and it will be done. Limit whip, OK? We all know about limiting whip. We do one thing at a time. It gets done. And we move on to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And at some point, we measure. And we see that there has been a material impact to the outcome that we're trying to achieve. If there's been no impact, okay, if there's been no change to attrition, revenue, all right, then we can in agile, inspect, and adapt. Okay? We can actually determine whether or not we're on the right path. We can also bring in lean startup concepts and pivot. All right? This path that we're going is not appropriate. It's not working for us. So let's change the model. Let's change what we're doing. OK? So oh, here's an example one that's filled in for a startup. This is actually one I'm using right now for a startup um, that I'm mentoring. Right? These are the things. Their financial plans, pretty important. They've got to get that first. All right? Things like video marketing and whatever else, eh, not so important to them. All right? But let's be pragmatic. Not everything is, can be done in that direct order. All right? These guys had an appointment with a lawyer. Okay? The terms and conditions, not the highest value thing we could do, but had to be done first in order to have the meeting with the lawyer. All right? So our direction, our path through this canvas is slightly adjusted based on common sense. Now, I know there's nothing common about common sense, but let's try for a couple of, a couple of days. Make sense? Yes? So, let me talk about what, hang on, let me just check the time. Good, I've got 10 minutes. So, let's talk about the, uh, some of the enablers to what we're talking about here. So, technology can enable no projects. It doesn't have to be. All right? If you have a traditional technology stack, mainframes, for example, you can't do DevOps, then maybe you're not going to be able to do a lot of this. Okay? But think about the culture, the organizations that are emerging, the continuous organizations, okay? the continuous culture that your own organizations are starting to adopt. All right? This continuous culture is emerging in all aspects of work. All right? Now, continuous integration has been around for, to be honest, maybe two decades. All right? Anyone here not doing continuous integration? I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so continuous integration has been around for a very long time. And I know a lot of organizations that still haven't quite got it right. I know organizations who still aren't doing unit testing, so let's just put that to the side. All right? But con once you get the continuous integration in place, you can start to think about continuous deployment, continuous delivery. All right? Once you've got teams in place, okay, you can start doing DevOps and have a seamless transition. Those who build also maintain. So there is no handover. There is no um, uh, BAU. All right? It's just the one team who is accountable for the change. All right? You put those in place, you're already at no projects. All right? you're already at a product-based delivery. All right? The outcome being the value of the product, all right? this cross-functional team who, is, who never ends. Now, project managers. I've been talking for half an hour now, all right? 35 minutes. 
what do you see your role is? Have I just fired you? Who here thinks they're not going to have a job in five years? None of you? You do. You and I can talk after this. <laughs> All right? For the, for the other 40 or 50 of you who didn't put your hand up, what do you think your job is going to be in five years? Continuous project delivery. Uh, okay, okay. No, no, that's actually, a, that's actually a good answer, and I'll explain why in a, mi in a minute. Product owner, all right? Now, I must admit there is a natural conflict between a project manager and a product owner, okay? And if you were, if you want to transition to a product owner type role, uh, there's a few things about project management that you need to unlearn, all right? But putting that to the side, there is a natural path for project managers to become product owners, right? Continuous project manager. What did you mean by that? What did you, what did you mean by continuous project manager? Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you, 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 you're creating a very hierarchical structure of projects. Uh, that's a portfolio. Okay. And, and we still have the same issues of things ending. Okay, and, and, and when you say continuous project manager, I'm going to both agree and disagree with you. Okay, I'm going to agree, so I'm going to disagree with you because of this. All right, everything that has been done in the last 60 years around project management, all the science behind it, is based on that definition a temporary endeavor. It ends. All right, so. Being a continuous project manager is actually a contradiction in terms. All right? However, I will go so far as to say that a continuous man let's remove the word project out of that statement. Okay? Time is no longer relevant. Cost is no longer relevant, because the question is not how much does it cost, it's how much is it worth. All right? Scope is agile. Scope's been irrelevant now for a couple of decades. All right? So what remains? Risk? coordination, stakeholder engagement, collaboration. These are all skills that a project manager has and, and has learned quite effectively. These skills, these demands from an organization do not go away. So there, there is a role for a project manager to, to lead these continuous teams, these value delivery teams. Now, I wouldn't call it continuous project manager, but some form of coordination, and governance around that is still necessary. So you're, it, that's why it's a really good answer. It's both true and false at the same time. It's like Schrodinger's answer. OK. OK. So does anyone else want to take a stab at that question? No? Let's go to the final, final question. The whole premise, the whole precept behind no projects is that what you do is not as important as the value that it produces. All right? At the very beginning, I said the question was, what is it worth? All right? And this is the key point. All right? If your manager, if you say, we need to upgrade this server, okay, or this suite of servers, or you need to send me to the conference, or da, 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 da. it doesn't matter what it is you're trying to achieve. And the first question out of that manager's mouth is, how much does it cost? That manager is being lazy. Okay? He is, or she is. She's putting the onus of proof on you. But the problem is, how much does it cost is the wrong question. It has always been the wrong question. We just haven't really realized it till now. The question is, how much is it worth? All right? We need to upgrade this server in order to achieve operational stability? Well, how much is operational stability worth for you? All right? 
And if it's not worth very much at all, then let's not do the work. All right? If it's worth quite a bit from, a, from an organization perspective, then it doesn't matter how much does it cost. Okay? As long, the, the, the only thing that's important is how much does it cost in a general sense is less than how much it's worth. Okay? Because we still need to know, like, if it's going to cost, a, like, if to do a, to have a meaningful impact on the outcome is going to cost a million dollars and it's only worth a couple of hundred thousand to the business, then let's not even begin. Okay? Because we will not have a material impact within the value that is allotted to us. All right? Now, I want to finish on one final point. All right? Here's the secret. Projects are not an IT construct. Projects are a finance construct. All right? The only reason we have projects is to keep finance happy. All right? If you go to your organization and you say, let's get rid of projects, all right, finance is going to throw a fit. They're going to go, we can't do that. All right, so what you need to learn is how to talk to finance, how to have a conversation with finance about, you know what, maybe there's a different way, and we can make your life easier. Okay? We don't have this project funding cycle, because let's face it, the project funding cycle is always wrong anyway. All right? how, once again, I asked how many people on time, on budget, on scope, four of you put your hand up. All right? So if we can't get it right and, project is base, and finance is basing their funding models on that, we have a problem. Outcome-based, how much is it worth, that is linear. If it's worth a million dollars, then that's what we will spend in a year. All right? There may be variation over time as, as things become more or less valuable to the organization, but it is a linear burn. We can make finances life easier. All right? And here's the thing you need to know. When you go to your organization and go, I saw this great talk, let's go for, um, let's try and get rid of projects, and finance comes into the equation, just tell them, we can make your life easier. All right? And it's amazing how quickly they'll work with you if you can say those words. All right? Final point, Yuri and I are doing a workshop on this tomorrow morning at 10, 11.15. All right, so we're going to go into a bit of more case studies and we're going to help. You can ask some questions and try and come to the same conclusions based on the concepts that we've discussed here. All right, so if you're interested, come along to the workshop tomorrow. Um, and with that, I believe I am out of time. Time for a couple of questions.